Well, everything has been playing out the way I expected it to. You know, when everything happened, I got that sudden surge of subscribers, probably around 3,500-ish. And then my 15 minutes of fame has come and gone. And now I'm at a point where I'm actually losing subscribers, which is perfectly fine. That's what I expected to happen once people saw a few more of my newer videos and then probably realized this isn't the kind of channel that I want to follow. And that's completely fair. So I knew these things would happen. I knew my uh, celebrity status would be short lived. I never had any uh, fantasies that it would be anything beyond that. And the one interview that I did over at EBN. Now, speaking of, I want to give shout outs where they're due. You know, first and foremost, Echo Base Network and rest of the family, Coach, Nick, and then everyone I met through them, uh, Matt Cave Gaming, the DA, Junk, X-Wing. There's a few others that came on the stream. Sorry if I don't remember your name. It was great to meet you all. A lot of return commenters from the EBN community. They've been great, actually. Uh, some have been inviting me to Discord, which I honestly don't use Discord that much. Just don't have time for it, to be honest. Uh, let's see, Drunk3PO for stopping into some of our streams and the rest of Geeks and Gamers. Still enjoy your content. That Park Place, uh, enjoying the content. I'm sorry we haven't been able to connect. I know you wanted to get me on for a stream, but our schedules just, just aren't lining up unless I you know, take some time off of work, unfortunately. And last but not least, Film Threat, Chris Gore, who has been very supportive uh, watching my streams and just my other videos. When all this happened, I had watched a Film Threat stream and Chris said some really nice things about me. Like he didn't even know I was in the stream. And the topic of my original videos came up and Chris said some really thoughtful, insightful things that kind of told me that he is probably one of the few content creators on this platform that really understood me, where I came from, and the position I was in. So I definitely appreciate that. And yeah, Chris, I've seen your comments on my videos. Appreciate it. I did send you an email. It might be in your spam folder, but I have reached out because I would love to connect. I would love to talk film, fandom, you know, AI, whatever. Um, so yeah, I have reached out. I hope we can connect. I really would love to. So getting back to what this video is about, you know, obviously, if you're here, you most likely know that I worked at Lucasfilm for eight years, primarily worked only on Star Wars IP, credit on a lot of productions. And at some point, I come to the realization that things had changed. I had changed. I wasn't where I wanted to be anymore, which is weird because there was a time where I felt like this is the only thing I want to do for the rest of my life. But sometimes things change. And I also felt that if I was going to stay a person of technology, a professional, and technology that I would have to get caught up on tech and entertainment doesn't really stay up to date on technology and I was falling very far behind. So in this video, I'm gonna share a little bit about that journey, leaving Lucasfilm, Star Wars, and finding myself on a path that didn't make sense to me or people that knew me. You know, within two years time, I would find myself going from a galaxy far away to driving a Peterbilt semi. It was quite a journey and is actually one of the best things to ever happen for my career and for me personally. And that's what I want to share in this video. So when I left originally the studio, I had a gig lined up with a tech startup. And that's the big thing in San Francisco, right? All these tech startups. Almost everyone I knew was going to them, making a lot of money. And I wanted to get mine had an opportunity come up. Now, this was a company that was actually being staffed by a lot of former Lucasfilm and ILM people. And the way I had believed or what was sold to me was that the people running the startup wanted those that could think outside the box to solve problems creatively. And I thought, yeah, I'm a fit for that. So I ended up at the startup. And you know, for the first few months, it really felt like this was the right course in life. I, well, like everyone else in a startup, I wore multiple hats, right? I originally came in as a program manager, but then I was also an office manager, then even a programmer, uh, building test mobile apps on Android, even a video editor. 
we were working on some products trying to build like some next generation display devices, you know, specifically glasses and not like AR or VR glasses, but glasses that would like you see in Minority Report, right? They would just you would see instead of having to look at your phone to see a text message, you could see it in your glasses. And we were working on some prototypes for that. And it really felt like this is it, right? This is going to this is going to pop off. We're going to pull it off. We had some early, early conceptual models and data that hinted towards that this could be possible. And I really felt like this was going to be where I would just make that big jump out of entertainment and maybe the company goes public or get bought up by Google and I make millions of dollars and then I can retire to a cabin and just do photography for, for the rest of my life. That's what I had hoped. Um, that is not what happened. So one thing I learned about tech startups is that TV show Silicon Valley isn't a comedy. It's a documentary. Um, they really are just that nuts and ridiculous and out of control. And then I realized something about the tech industry that I didn't really know, which was a lot of the fishy, shady behavior of a lot of these startups. A lot of these startups like to get a lot of investor money and then they pay themselves a lot. And then they let the company go under saying, oh, we couldn't produce the product or whatever. Investors would lose their money, but the people working in the company is still profit and they move on to the next startup or con, however you want to view it. Well, I actually wanted to be a part of something that built something that people used. Now, at one point, I was asked to build or to create some concept videos of what the displays might look like in the glasses. OK, so I went around just with my camera, just recorded footage walking down Main Street, you know, doing whatever. And then I would use like After Effects and basically do like visual effects, kind of minority report kind of things. Right. It, I had like little faked text messages or a Google Maps app, what it might look like if it was in your glasses and how that could be useful. So it's complete like visual concept idea. Like this is what it could look like. And as I understood, this was meant to get investors interested. However, we end up in a meeting with a lot of investors. We're down Silicon Valley. And one of the C levels of the startup shows the video footage that I created, the video samples, and actually says, this is what we have working. I was floored, right? I don't like being part of a con and I couldn't believe that was said. Of course, some of the investors, uh, they're smart and they ask, well, can we see the device? And then there was like some excuses that were made up. And of course, I think they smelled BS. Now, what this is referred to commonly in the industry is called vaporware. It's a product. It can be hardware, software. It's announced it, it, it has marketing material, but it's never actually manufactured or created. And a lot of times it's just canceled. And if you're thinking, well, it sounds like a con. Yeah. Yeah. You're uh, you're not far off on that one. And I realized, was I part of a company that was making just vaporware? I mean, it felt like we were doing some work, right? We did. We did have some optical work we were doing with lasers. We were working on the mobile app on Android that would feed data to the glasses. I was working a little bit on that. I really felt like we were trying to make something. At that point, though, I felt there was something up. Eventually, a lot of people pulled out of the company. I understand why. We didn't get further investment. We got ghosted by some of the management. We stopped getting paid. Of course, I stopped working. OK, I'm not going to work for free. However, I was technically a salaried employee. So even though I'm not working, I should be getting paid. <laughs> So there was a few months of complete silence, um, not getting paid before the CEO appears from wherever he went to, <clears throat> finally responding to emails saying I'm shutting the company down. That lasted probably a little over a year. I had moved my family away from the Bay Area to save money. I was, even though not working, still technically on payroll, though, as a salary employee, definitely owed quite a bit, uh, five figures in back pay that I had not received. So then I found myself at a weird transition. What do I do? I, I didn't want to return to animation with my tail between my legs. I really didn't. It's like, no, I'm not going to do this. I did try for some tech jobs. I interviewed over at Facebook, and I mentioned this in another video. That was the single worst job interview I've ever had in my life, ever. Interviewed with a kid, and I do mean kid. He was two years out of college and a senior manager and pretty much invalidated my 20-plus years of experience 
saying I didn't have real experience by his standards. A just really arrogant young man, kid, that really upset me. I've never, never been treated that bad in an interview. I've had interviews not go well, but that is an interview that I was straight up disrespected in. I just looking back, you know, I see all the interviews on TV with Mark Zuckerberg. I just think people like him higher in their image. So my speculation, Mark hires in his image, and then you get these other pompous little tech bros, and then they hate old guys like me. What to do? Uh, Google had kind of written me off. I did try reapplying to them. They did not respond. So I interviewed at Google probably 2014, 2015, if I remember right. And I'm not sure how much any of you know about Google, but their tech interviews you did. So usually in tech interviews, you would do like a coding test. And I didn't have too many issues with that. However, Google's coding test was they wanted you to write code on a whiteboard. Now, the theory is, and I do see the logic in it, is they wanted you to talk about how you solve problems, not really solve a problem. It's like, okay, that makes sense. What they what they won't do in the interview, and they told you, they told me this, is they said, we won't ever talk about your prior experience, which I had issues with. When this interview happened, I had not applied to Google. I was referred to by several former colleagues who had been working at Google or pinged by Google for jobs. And more than one of them had responded to the recruiters, no, I think this is the guy you need to talk to for this position. I think he's a great candidate. So I never applied. They reached out to me. But then they put me in this interview process where they say, we don't talk about your experience. And I'm thinking that's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. I'm here because people I've worked next to have seen me work under extreme pressure and perform and deliver. But I played along for all I could, you know, writing the code on the whiteboard. What I was dealing with was a panel of Google members who were all like PhD or PhD candidates. And so what that means is a lot of these people who come up uh, in the educational system and programming, they, they do theoretical coding on a whiteboard with professors. They talk about theoretical problems and theoretical algorithms. I've never in my eight years at Lucasfilm solved a theoretical problem. Okay, everything was a real problem, a real issue. All right, there's no theory with what I ever did. But I still tried playing along. And at one point I got really frustrated because one of them, he wouldn't let it go either. You know, I'm, I'm writing code on a whiteboard, which just felt stupid anyways. And he says, oh, I think that might be a syntax error. I was like, it might just be sloppy handwriting, but either way, it's, it's code on a whiteboard. It's not going to compile. It can't have syntax error, right? I thought this was about the thought process. He wouldn't let it go. Would not let it go. He's like, I just don't think this code will run. I think it looks like a syntax error. I was like, it's sloppy handwriting. It's code on a whiteboard. None of this will run. And I started realizing I was dealing with people who have never actually, in my opinion, solved real problems in production. People who have never had to sit next to the customer they're writing code for. If you're like a pipeline or technical guy in the animation industry and you're writing tools for artists and you're sitting next to artists, you're getting real-time feedback all day long what they think of the tools that you write. And it can be brutal. And I think that gave me some pretty thick skin over the years. And I realized I was sitting next to people that didn't know how it was to deal with the end user that you're writing tools for. There's so many layers in Google. The people that are writing these Google apps a lot of us use are never having any, any interaction with the end user. And all I've had in my years was interactions with the end user. And I finally decided this isn't the right job for me and I entered the interview process, which really insulted them. A little bit of an attitude to these big companies like, hey, we're Google, how dare you end the interview? It's like, Interviews go both ways. Okay. Yeah. I entered the interview process. I couldn't connect. I couldn't see myself working with this group at all. So what do I do? Right. Uh, I burned through my unemployment, applying for jobs everywhere. I even, I got interviews and this is when I first started learning about AI was coming up. I actually got sent links to do interview screenings with AI chatbots. I had problems with this. Like I needed a job, but also like if I want to work somewhere, or someone wants me to work for them, I want to speak to a person. I had a hard time taking those seriously. I even had uh, some awkward interviews where I was brought in by people that had no intention of hiring me, but they were diehard Star Wars fans. All they wanted to do was talk about Star Wars. 
and a little bit over the tech and how I worked in Star Wars. But at the end of the day, they had no intentions. They're like, oh, you're overqualified. You don't want to work here. It's like, yeah, well, don't want to lose my car and not feed my kids either. That happened a few times. I even interviewed somewhere. I just went to a basic IT company. It's like, can I get a job just uh, fixing computers, putting desktops back together, right? And that seemed okay. I interviewed with initially with the office manager, really nice guy, another military veteran like me, but it felt like it was going good. So I went in and I interviewed with the owner of the company and I got weird vibes the whole time. And he's like, well, I want to do a test, troubleshooting test. I'm like, okay, that's fine. And you go into a lab and you have this computer that's not booting up. And then you just figure out why it's not booting up, fix it and get it booted up. I do a test and then he changes the scope. He goes, well, now you have to fix this. And I have to fix that. He keeps bringing me things. And at one point, I even even hear him in the hallway kind of arguing with his office manager. His office manager's like, hey, this is kind of unfair. You didn't make the other candidates go through this many tests. And he just said something like, I don't care. And what I started getting the feeling was he wanted to show up, this, this dude from a big tech company in San Francisco. Well, not tech company, but a big company in, in the Bay Area. I really felt that he just wanted to take me down a notch to boost his own ego. And the test went on and on. Like I went in there for a, you know, typical 30 minute interview, 30 minutes for interview and test hour and a half later, still in there playing games. And then I have to pick up my kid from school. I just left. It's like, I'm, I'm not doing this. So I really had a lot of problems finding work. A lot of you're too qualified. A lot of, we don't understand why someone that worked on star Wars would ever want to work for us. The first work bit of work I found was temporary work very early in the morning, working for Amazon warehouse, just sorting packages, money's money, right? You got to swallow your pride and pay bills. And that's what I did. What do I have to say about working on Amazon? Uh, I set my expectations very, very, very low. They still managed to disappoint. So whatever you heard about Amazon warehouse, not being a good place to work. Yeah. Yeah. That's putting it lightly. All the while, though, I started attending a trucking school because there was transportation jobs everywhere. Driving with the family, I see signs everywhere saying hiring CDL drivers, hiring CDL drivers. Man's got to work. Man has got to work. So I found a trucking school and started learning how to drive big rigs. And a couple of guys at the school, they eventually learned about me. I think, you know, they go home, and they Google your name. <clears throat> I admit I do that to people all the time. Come into school the next day and... <laughs> Actually, one of the instructors did, and we're, we're doing driving tests, driving through, drive around Sacramento. And he just looks over at me at some point. He goes, is this really you? And he, he pulls up my IMDb. And I was like, yeah, that's actually me. He's like, what the hell? I'm like, it's, it's a long story. He's like, all right. <laughs> so I got my CDL. It's a lot of work. It's, it is a lot of work. The first gig I found was a seasonal gig hauling almonds and belly dumpers. And what a belly dumper is, is... This right here, you've probably seen these around. Uh, they fill up, up in the top and they can carry a lot of different things. I was hauling almonds, but uh, they get filled in the top. And then when you get to the factory, you open up at the bottom and they, they dump out the belly. That's why they're called belly dumpers. Drove those for a little bit. And then I got a gig working for a uniform laundry company called Centos. So you probably see these little white vans. There's a few companies around Centos, Mission, that provide uniforms, soaps, paper towels to companies. In fact, next time you're in a restaurant at a bathroom and you see a soap dispenser on the wall, look at the name on the soap dispenser. It might say Centos. So I got a, a job with one of their factories, basically just moving dirty laundry between distribution facilities and a laundry facility. It was weird. It was, I didn't mind the work. Like, it's honest work. But friends and family were really confused. <laughs> like, how did you go from that to this? And, you know, I was even feeling down at times, a little depressed. Like, was I nothing without Star Wars? You know, I started having you know, a lot of confidence issues. But I kept myself focused, right? Need to provide, pay bills, stay afloat. And we were just bar barely staying afloat. Uh, shortly after I started driving with them, the pandemic happened. You know, a lot of companies shut down. We kept working. It got better for me. Uh, the roads got quieter. 
the scales, so you ever drive down the highways, you see the weigh stations, the scales on the side. Uh, that's where trucks have to pull into, get weighed, get inspected. A couple months, you know, a few months there, it seemed like they weren't pulling anyone in and inspecting them because of the pandemic, which is nice, right? It was just quiet. All I did was drive. No meetings, no HR run team bonding sessions, the song and dance BS. It was just honest work. And I appreciated that. Didn't make a lot, made a whopping 25 bucks an hour. So I was getting home by noon, starting very early in the morning, usually home by noon and still spending the afternoons working on my tech skills. You know, for a while, LinkedIn, you could get free LinkedIn premium if you're a veteran. And I was using that to leverage the LinkedIn training so I could start taking courses for free. But yeah, it was it was a weird time, but also the best of times. Not only was it humbling, I was able to reconnect, reconnect with humanity, people. So when you don't put in a full eight hours, like my driving shift is done, they say we can go around the plant and find some work to do with the other teams helping them out to get your eight hours. So one group I always liked was, I can't remember what they were called, but they unloaded all the small trucks. And that could be a dirty job. I mean, a lot of these uniforms coming in from mechanics, factories, food services, they could be stinky, dirty, greasy. And there's this group that had the best attitude I've ever seen. They were very humble, and very appreciative of everything. They took turns and each person got to play the music that they liked that day when they're unloading trucks. And so what it was, was a each day, everyone got to experience what someone else enjoyed. There was no talking crap, right? Everyone just, you enjoy that person's music. You just listen to it. Didn't matter what it was. And you help your teammate unload the vehicles. And they just had the best attitude. It's such a dirty job and probably not paying very well either because they looked at me like, oh man, you're one of the truck drivers. You guys get paid good. And I'm like, no, <laughs> if you say so. But there's something else that I noticed, something I'd forgotten about. At one point, we were taking a break, five minute break. And I heard a young lady saying that she's been saving for the past couple months to take her younger sibling out to some new Marvel movie. So she's been saving for the movie ticket and the popcorn. That's something I hadn't done in a long time was saved for something that, that many would consider my position to be simple, right? This past weekend, we took the kids to a movie without even thinking about it. No saving. We just took them to the theaters. And you forget a lot of people don't live like that. You know, they want to enjoy these things too, but they have to save for everything. They have to save for every movie ticket. They have to save for every app. They would talk about their favorite mobile gaming apps because they couldn't afford computers. So the only computer they had, their whole connection to the outside world was their phone. That's how they find their jobs. That's how they get their entertainment. They watch TV shows on their phone. They play video games on their phone. So they would talk about their favorite mobile gaming apps and having to save to buy those apps that they wanted. And this is something that I'd lost touch with, you know, working in tech, working in the studios, people be like, oh, the new game is out. And they just buy the, they'd buy the uh, app and not think twice about it. And I found myself around people that had to think about it. It was, they lived on very tight budgets. And it was humbling to be around, to, to listen to them talk about that and how much it meant to them to get that movie ticket or, or get that mobile app. Something I think a lot of us in the positions that I've been in take for granted. I had certainly lost a connection with my blue collar roots and I felt that this was an opportunity to reconnect, to remind myself where I came from. Now I had no idea where I was gonna go after this. I knew I wasn't gonna drive trucks forever. I actually enjoyed it. I like driving trucks. I don't like the transportation industry, but I love driving. But I figured I'd probably go back to technology, maybe mobile apps, maybe even animation, which actually did sort of happen. But this experience reminded me what was important, that these people that consume the content we create, or the apps we make, that we have a responsibility to meet their needs and to connect to these people and see how hard they work every single day for this content was a reminder like what we owe them. And that even though you may get paid a lot more than them to make the content, it doesn't mean you are better than them. Their opinions matter. They are your customer. And having the opportunity to connect with them, to have that experience, to listen to them, it was one of the most humbling things in my life. And I come to a realization of how arrogant I may have become while working in the studios and working in tech, how out of touch I must have become to think that I knew more than people that weren't behind the scenes 
and maybe even think that their voices don't matter and ultimately losing touch with the people that we should have been inspiring and entertaining. These people that sacrifice so much to keep this country running and working and all they ask for in return is an enjoyable form of entertainment, something that was made for them, something without agendas. And I think people who are out of that world for too long and have never been in that world are not in touch with that. They may think they are. I mean, I, I grew up like that. And just in the eight years that I spent, I do believe I lost touch with that. With people that I believe a lot of these companies are forgetting about. I would only end up driving for about six months before returning to animation, sort of. And I returned as a cloud engineer still during the pandemic to help studios, small studios, build remote pipelines. And I stayed on track with my courses and my training and it ultimately led me to my final exit of the industry. And the past few months, I've let my CDL expire, downgrading back to a regular license. Now that I'm back doing what I want to do and where I should be, and I put my focus, my energy into my certifications. That time that I spent was one of the most important things that I've ever done for me professionally. Reminding me of the people that are out there, the people that we, whether in software or entertainment, we have responsibility. They don't work for us. We work for them. And as hard as that time was on both me and my family, I feel it was very important for me. And so that's part of my story that I wanted to share that I don't think I've gotten out in interviews. I think I've just lightly touched on it, but I've never taken the time to sit down and talk about it and what it meant to me and how it was one of the best things that ever happened. So, so the next time you're at the grocery store and you see an older man packing your groceries, running a cash register, you're probably thinking, what's he doing here? He may not have had a choice. That could have very well been me. These things happen in life. And what I hope is that someone out there that's watching this that can connect with it, they were, they were somewhere in their career, something happened, and now they're at a point in their life that they didn't expect to be, nor that they want to be. I'm hoping this is inspiration that doesn't have to be the end, but also I understand where you're at. I understand the frustration. I understand reflecting on what you might have done wrong to end up there. But what I do hope you can take away from this is that there's something to learn from it. And I would have never learned this lesson if I hadn't had this experience, and I'm very grateful for it. So I wanna wrap up this video. This is just something I've wanted to get off my chest for a very long time, and I'm glad I'm able to talk about it. And I'd be interested in hearing your experiences in the comments or what you think. Uh, side note, it turns out my partner does have Disney Plus. She gets it as a perk through her mobile carrier. I guess I don't have much of an excuse now. I should, I should watch it. I mean, to be fair, I've poked some fun at it. I've been laughing at jokes, but I haven't actually seen it. So maybe a reaction video is in order in the very near future. We'll see. Well, that's all I have for this video. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you again next time.